Welcome to the uh, Pax Britannica rules description. This is an eight-player game that recreates the dynamics of the colonial era from 1880 to the outbreak of the Great War, the First World War. Uh, players include Britain, France, Germany. Uh, you can also have a player for Austria, Hungary, uh, Italy, Japan, Russia, the U.S., and Belgium. And you can also arrange for Netherlands, Spain, and Portugal to be players. Each player spends money to buy and maneuver military forces to establish control over various areas of the world, and each controlled area can generate income that will in turn increase the player's treasury, which can then be later redeemed for victory points. As conflicting colonial strategies develop, players form alliances and negotiate with other great powers. When compromise and conciliation fail, wars may occur. Moreover, various random events can cause unrest in a player's colonies, forcing players to quell native uprisings or face the loss of a colony. Ultimately, each player will attempt to fulfill their colonial expansion strategy at the expense of other players. Conflict is to be expected, although players must be careful to avoid uh, causing the outbreak of the Great War. Uh, the map itself uh, represents the entire globe of conquerable colonies and unconquerable home territories and various general charts and country-specific placements. Uh, areas, of which there are 104, are represented by squares that contain values that refer to the area's economic value and its defense value, and contain a color-coded association with a sea area if they are coastally located. Adjacent areas are connected by an overland route. There are, 12, there are uh, five uh, distinct color-coded land areas. Uh, independence, uh, these typically contain uh, weak states or traditional states. Uh, the Ottoman, the Chinese Empire and Tributary, and Unorganized. And these represent weak potential colonies um, uh, and, and other areas. Uh, there are 12 uh, color-coded sea areas, as well as two capes, the Cape of Good Hope and Cape Horn at the bottom of South America. Home territories of the great and small powers can never be invaded nor blockaded. And here you can see Belgium, uh, Netherlands, Great Britain, France, Portugal, Spain, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy. Uh, there are others uh, on the map. The game lasts for 10 game turns or until the outbreak of the Great War, which ends the game immediately and severely punishes the player who brought it about. The turn track indicates the receipt of extra merchant fleets as well as the penalty for causing uh, the, great, uh, the Great War. The Great War breaks out when the European Tension Index reaches a value of 100. It represents the gradual militarization of diplomacy. Notice that it captures the emerging naval arms race as well uh, between the British and the Germans. So these are some of the ships that were involved. You've got the pre-Dreadnought uh, class. This is the uh, uh, HMS Dreadnought itself, which the British uh, built as a revolutionary new uh, all-big gun ship. This is the, the British High Seas Fleet. This is the uh, German uh, fleet. This is the, a Russian ship being sunk by the Japanese at the Battle of Tsushima in 1905. This is the Potsuchima Russian fleet, or the remnants of it. This is a, a depiction of the naval arms race between uh, England and Germany in the lead-up to the uh, First World War and uh, subsequently. Um, uh, here you can see a group of uh, simulators playing uh, the game, representing their, their countries. And the game's got a lot of unstructured uh, negotiating, which is very important. Now, Greg Kostikian, the designer of the game, has provided uh, good insights in his comments uh, and the general philosophy um, of, of why the game was designed. And the zeitgeist of the age is probably best captured by the poem uh, White Man's Burden by uh, Rudyard Kipling. Uh, here it is. Uh, Take up uh, the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed, Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' needs. He was highlighting the great spread of civilization um, uh, that was believed by many of the colonial administrators. And Greg Kostetkin has asked us to compare the violence of the 20th century with the more uh, principled uh, practices of the 19th century. In contrast, uh, Edward Said, a former Columbia University professor, termed this and other justification of European imperialism as Orientalism. And this is his quote, Orientalism can be discussed and analyzed as the corporate institution for dealing with the Orient, dealing with it by making statements about it, authorizing views of it, describing it by teaching it, settling it, ruling over it. In short, Orientalism as a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. 
Edward Said said, quote, Every empire, however, tells itself and the world that it is unlike all other empires and its mission is not to plunder and control, but to educate and liberate. Mahatma Gandhi uh, said, My heart rebels against any foreigner imposing on my country the peace which is here called Pax Britannica. Uh, in the corner, you can see uh, Gandhi in his uniform as a warrant officer uh, during uh, the Boer War. Now, imperialism and, and the Pax Britannica was not inevitable. British Prime Minister is Gladstone and, and uh, was, was an anti-imperialist, and Disraeli was an imperialist. Uh, both served multiple terms, and they reversed each other's imperial policies in turn. Disraeli generally prevailed in the 19th century, and Gladstone prevailed by the mid-20th century. Now, back to the game. Each player is provided with an information card that indicates the initial placement of pieces on the map, and an initial administrative record that must be recorded on the player's administrative record sheet. The administrative record sheet must be updated continuously through the game and helps calculate the income, expenses, and victory points for each player. So this is the one for Great Britain, for uh, France, for uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary, for Russia, Japan, the US, Italy. So the initial setup will need to be done immediately prior to the beginning of play, and you can see here the regions associated with control markers, uh, fleets, um, armies, and uh, merchant uh, forces. Now Pax Britannica is played in 10 game turns, which are in turn broken down into phases as part of a game turn sequence of play, and we're going to take a look at each of these steps uh, in turn. Um, the random number generation uh, will, be, will be obtained via the random function of a calculator in the professor's possession, be rolled by the player. So the first phase requires rolling for the number of random events, and then rolling two dice to determine which random event will occur. Events can include domestic developments in the Great Powers or unrest in one of the areas. Unrest is important because it requires resident occupiers to garrison their states. But they also permit the invasion of Chinese, Ottoman, and independent areas, which are otherwise uh, inaccessible. So game pieces include three denominations, each of army and naval units, merchant ships, and four symbols, which are in turn uh, interests, which are designated by a circle, uh, influence with a bar, protectorates, which are a triangle, and possessions, which are a flag. The 1, 3, and 10 denominations are not interchangeable, and players may not buy more pieces than are available in the game. So the U.S. and U.K., however, can create dominions and states, which are represented by specific uh, flags. Can you spot uh, the original uh, Canadian uh, dominion flag? So states assert their power onto land areas through a five-step pro progression of markers, each of which is more expensive but also generates more income for the state. Interest and influence and the three control markers, protectorates, possession, and for the UK and the US, dominion and state markers. Control markers, which are protectorates and possessions, tend to trigger violent Chinese and Ottoman reactions. So in the game turn, we begin uh, in the sequence of play, we begin with the administrati administrative phase. Um, so we're gonna focus on the administrative record sheet, okay, which you can see here. So section one, uh, here you identify the number of dominions, states, possessions, protectorates, and their economic values, and the number of influence and interest areas and their respective values. Note that each game turn has two boxes. The first is to calculate the initial game turn values, and the second box is for recording uh, changes that occur during the course of the turn. Section two, uh, you roll for income from the colonial office. Players with no control markers, in other words, no protectorates, possessions, or dominions, receive the maximum possible value, except for Austria-Hungary, which must always roll. So here you can see the colonial office chart with the, uh, the one to six uh, variable uh, outcome. Section two, uh, here to calculate the total income, you multiply the number of areas by status category against the income value uh, to calculate the total income. So because different areas have uh, different uh, values, um, uh, and some areas are more wealthy and other, part, other areas are less wealthy. In section three, uh, to calculate the total expenses, you take the total face value of military, land, and naval units outside of states, dominions, and home territories. 
because if they're if they're uh, on those uh, in if they're in states, dominions, and home territories, military units are free. Then you multiply the total cost by the status type to calculate the total maintenance. In section four, the net income is calculated by subtracting the net expenses from the net income. So there's a useful uh, income uh, maintenance cost analysis chart that helps you balance income and maintenance costs for different status markers and area economic values. Uh, an important uh, note is that uh, protectorates and possessions need a minimum of one military unit as a garrison. So in uh, section five, victory point uh, record is calculated at the end of the turn. Um, in section uh, seven, you have a final victory point record, which is calculated once uh, only at the end of the game. Uh, players win by getting the most victory points, so you have to pay attention uh, to the process by which victory points uh, are obtained. Uh, two victory points are given uh, for signed treaties in writing that are presented to the professor. Uh, secret treaties must also be written and covertly passed uh, to the professor. Failure to come to the aid of a minor state that you promised you would protect during a status dispute results in a minus five victory point. In other words, loss of your credibility. Um, you can think here of, of pan-Slavism and how a guerrilla princeship's assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo uh, ultimately led to the outbreak of the First World War because the Russians honored their uh, security guarantee to the Serbs. So in terms of victory point penalties, the turn track records victory point penalties awarded to all states if the Great War breaks out in that turn. A Great War breaks out either when the European tension level reaches a value of 100 or when a war breaks out which involves four of the great powers, including the UK, France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Russia, and Italy. So, and it excludes the US, Japan, or Belgium, or Spain, uh, Portugal, and Netherlands. The state whose action starts the Great War, either directly or indirectly through treaties, or by increasing the European tension level to the value of 100, or whose entry as the fourth great power turns a war into the Great War, by, by making it uh, four great power member participants, suffers a three-time penalty, a three-fold penalty. Now, if you look at the uh, chart, the, uh, the penalty actually decreases over time. So it might be a good strategy to force a war at the end when the penalty uh, is not so great because you can then lock in any advantages uh, that you have. Uh, other victory points can be received at the end of a turn uh, and at the end of the game will be discussed later. Uh, one of the things you can do is you can uh, build, a, build a canal. Uh, for the first time a uh, canal is built, either in uh, Central America or uh, on the Panama Canal, 15 victory points uh, are awarded. Right here, you can see the uh, the Pan Panama Canal. Uh, uh, the Hearst families and the Pulitzer families both sponsored filibusters to seize control uh, of Nicaragua to build a canal there. A uh, filibuster, the term, is a Spanish Dutch term referring to uh, freebooters uh, that was used uh, to describe the mercenaries that were sent to seize control of parts of uh, Nicaragua. Uh, there are also uh, charts to roll for minor power actions in the event that Spain, Portugal, and the Netherlands are uh, not uh, subject to player control, although I, I typically like to have a player uh, play those countries. Uh, so here you can see uh, if they're, uh, the, the, the players are not available, this is the random chart that manages the different actions of those states. Now, the next uh, 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 step in the sequence of play is the movement status change phase. It's the most important part of the game, and it's uh, remarkably unstructured. People are basically free to do um, as they wish um, in no particular order. So, players must pay for new military units and status markers. Players are limited to the pieces available in the game. When upgrading the status markers, uh, you charge only the difference in cost, not the total cost. You do have to pay immediately, though. All purchases and the administrative record sheet is always universally accessible, so any, any student can examine the uh, sheet of any other student. Players may move across the map to areas with which they have a communications link. A communications link is either a series of adjacent sea areas linked by merchant ships or land areas linked by controlled areas or a combination. States may not share their merchant ships. Merchant ships, once placed on the map, can be removed or relocated later on. Players may move naval and army units any distance as long as there's a communications link. 
Players may place new status markers in a land area and indicate these with an accompanying unestablished marker, which is a question mark. Negotiations and war later in the turn will resolve status marker conflicts. So you can definitely have conflicts on the markers, and we'll look at that in, in a moment. So players can only place status markers that are permitted by the status marker placement. Effect summary. Interest markers may be placed in any established area with a protectorate, but otherwise no status markers may be placed in any established protectorate or possession. Right, so here you can see the um, interests and influence, a protectorate and possession. So therefore, it's best to establish status markers early before other player status markers become control markers and exclude other player status markers. Interest markers are free to place, and so should, be, should all be placed. When areas have multiple placements of status markers by different players, there arises incompatibility that could result in conflict. For example, placement of a possession marker results in the loss of all other players' interest markers. All of these incompatibilities are resolved later in the marker adjustment phase or as a result of war. Status marker conflicts can only cause war if a casus belli is indicated on the status marker placement effects summary. States may never attack each other unless they have a casus belli. In other words, a justification of war, a cause of war. Um, a mutual casus belli exists um, uh, uh, when there are two unestablished protectorates or possessions. Later, either state could attack the other. The owner of an influence marker has a casus belli when it is in the presence of an opponent's protectorate or possession, or an attempt to create a protectorate or a possession. The placement of an influence marker can often be used to create an excuse to cause a war. There are other instances in which war can be initiated. Uh, first of all, the aggrieved party uh, of, of a party, of, of a treaty that is broken. And here are some other lists of the, uh, the casus belli that uh, players should be familiar with. Uh, U.S. newspapers um, uh, were one of the main causes of U.S. outrage over the Spanish uh, suppression of Cuba, which later uh, led to war. Um, the Americans have a Monroe Doctrine in which the U.S. has a casus belli against uh, any other state that tries to establish um, uh, controls into the Western Hemisphere, or MAP uh, W. Uh, in the Great Game, the British have a casus belli against any state that breaches the Khyber Pass or enters into uh, India, uh, which you can see um, uh, here. Um, in the fight against Pan-Slavism, oh, here you can see the Afghanistan border. Yeah, there you can see, uh, yeah, going breaking into Afghanistan. Here's a beautiful view of Russians. There's the Russian bear and the English lion, a lion uh, tormenting the Persian cat. Uh, so, in, in the fight against Pan Slavin, uh, Austria Hungary um, uh, has a casus belli against other states in Serbia and Romania. Uh, Russia has an Asian sphere of influence. Uh, having a treaty with an ally that has a casus belli or has a casus belli against it, um, denying straits access or canal access is also a casus belli. So if a player has entered into an unorganized uh, area uh, or any other area that has an unrest marker in it, it does not have a con and does not have a control marker from another player, it may try and conquer the area through colonial combat and establish a control marker. To resolve the combat, you determine first whether the target area has a strength of fewer than five or a five or greater, and then you have to use the appropriate combat results table. Then determine a ratio of the attacker's ground strength to the area strength and round in the favor of the area. The area strength is indicated inside the square. You then roll a, a, a die, 1d6, or use a random uh, uh, calculator, and there's six possible results. There's AE, which is attacker eliminated, the attacker is wiped out. AR, where the attacker must retreat. There's EX, which is exchange. Victory goes to the colonial power if the area is weaker and the colonial force survives. Uh, and in, in this case, you uh, wipe out the weaker party, and then the stronger party must match the uh, point value, the army point value of the wiped out forces. Half X uh, means that there's victory for the colonial power if the area is weaker and colonial forces survive. So it's the same condition. 
DR means um, the colonial uh, power wins, and uh, DE is the colonial power wins. So they're, they're a sort of a, a simplified uh, combat for uh, occupying of colonies. Now you then adjust markers to resolve the disputes voluntarily. If there remains any status marker conflicts that have provided one side or the other a casus belli, a Congress of Europe may be summoned. At the Congress, treaties may be imposed by the Congress on the disputant parties. Uh, you can imagine this occurred in 1895 after Japan's defeat of China. Uh, three European powers were not happy with the concessions China gave Japan, and so they compelled Japan to give up some of its acquisitions. Uh, here you can see the 1890 Berlin uh, Conference. Here's the 1899 uh, Hague Conference. Conferences were very common and largely regulated uh, the European uh, carving up of Africa. There were fewer conferences to deal with events in uh, Asia. So a player uh, with a casus belli against one or, or more of the other players or a minor powers can call for a Congress of Europe. All parties to the dispute over which the Congress is convened are automatically invited to the Congress. All other European players, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and Russia, may attend the Congress if they wish. The U.S. and Japan are members of a Congress only if they are party to the dispute or if they are unanimously invited to the Congress of Europe by all of the European powers or if the Congress is held in the U.S. or in Japan. As the, uh, at the Congress of Europe, treaties are drawn up, uh, debated, voted on, and imposed. If any player defies the treaty, then other parties to the treaty have a casus belli against it. So here's uh, China. The Chinese Empire is depicted in red and the vassal areas in yellow. Uh, European uh, depredations uh, uh, during the century of humiliation, um, during the... Uh, Qing Dynasty of China are, are remembered uh, to this day. Um, typically, it, in, it involved a reaction to the Europeans carving up uh, commercial and political privileges in uh, China. Uh, here you can see uh, a depiction of uh, Chinese uh, forces resisting the Japanese in the 1895 Sino-Japanese uh, War. And this is the destruction of the Chinese Beihang Fleet, the Northern Fleet, at the Battle of the Yalu River in Wei Highway by the Japanese in 1895. Uh, suffice it to say the Chinese fleet was uh, rapidly uh, destroyed by the Japanese. The uh, Chinese resentment accumulates from the action of the colonial powers. In the Chinese core areas, resentment increases from the placement of interest, influence, protector, and possession markers. In the Chinese vassal areas, resentment increases from the placement of protectorate, possession, markers. So Ch China is a... a, a basically uh, on the edge, politically resisting Western encroachment. So in order to determine if there is um, a revolt, uh, 3d6 is rolled, and uh, we have to see if it, if it rolls, the, the sum of three, three, three dice is um, less than the uh, tens value of the um, uh, Chinese resentment index. And that'll be illustrated in a, uh, in a second. Uh, if it is, then you consult the Chinese army placement table and you roll a 1d6 to see how many uh, Chinese uh, soldiers are deployed. And then you roll again to see which provinces they're deployed in. The uh, combined armies of the colonial powers uh, are here depicted defending their legations in Beijing against the Boxer Rebellion, which is uh, encouraged by... Uh, Qi Shi, the uh, princess uh, dowager of the, um, of the Qing dynasty in uh, 1901. Here you can see some of the boxers, the nationalist Chinese who are seeking to um, uh, uh, push Western influence and Japanese influence out of China. Uh, here you can see some of the colonial powers that intervened in China in 1901, including England, France, Germany, Japan, Russia, Italy, uh, contingents from Austria and the U.S., um, and we have the same, uh, the same relationship with the uh, Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire um, and war. If there are any control markers in the territory of the Ottoman Empire, um, then, uh, then there's an automatic reaction. One uh, army is placed in each of the Ottoman Empire areas. 
and these then attack uh, any of any of foreign parties that are in those areas. This is a depiction of the Russo Russo Turkish War of eighteen uh, in the eighteen seventies. So Turkey was uh, general the Ottoman Empire rather uh, centered around Anatolia and Turkey was seen as the sixth man of Europe. In, in in effect, it was an empire that was in decline, largely upheld by the English and French against the uh, uh, the Russians um, from as late as the end of the eighteenth uh, century. Um, and here you can see the dismantling of the Balkans by the Russians and the Austro-Hungarians. Uh, there are a couple of other conflicts, such as the Greco-Turkish Wars, uh, that were also uh, involved. The First and Second uh, Balkan Wars occurred largely as a result of the vacuum created by the retreat of the uh, European uh, Turkish Empire. So if there are remaining causes belli that were not resolved by the Congress of Europe, or if a state refused a treaty imposed on it by Congress, it has a casus belli against itself, by the aggrieved parties. So uh, war would then be the result. Oh, here you can see the, uh, yeah, the Greeks and the Turks fighting. Here's the Serbian-Bulgarian uh, War, which is one of the wars as a result of it. Um, so the, the uh, procedure would then be to go through um, these uh, different steps um, in war. So war proceeds through a sequence of phases without end until either one party is defeated by having uh, become confined to its home territory or the parties decide to negotiate an end to the conflict. For each war turn that the war continues, the European tension index increases. Uh, the two or more alliances are randomly divided into first, second, or third groups, depending on how many there are. Initiative is determined by rolling a 1d6, and the alliance with the initiative becomes the first alliance for this single war turn. Each player's uh, maneuver, each, player's, uh, each player other maneuvers their forces, attacks, and then confirms their supply status. Out of supply units are destroyed. Okay, so you can see the, the different steps here in the war sequence. Uh, here's the uh, combat results table. Uh, and this one here applies for uh, forces of fewer than uh, five points in strength. And this is for five or more. And this is a, a, a far more likely table to be used. Uh, combat is, is results are estimated differently than colonial combat. Again, you do roll a 1d6, but the, the uh, effects are different. Uh, AE uh, means the attacker is eliminated. AR is the attacker is retreated. EX, you eliminate all of the smaller force, and the attacker suffers equal to the destroyed force. Uh, with half EX, you eliminate all of the smaller force, and the attack suffers equal to half of the destroyed force. DR, uh, the defender is forced to retreat, and DE, the defender, is eliminated. Now, the German uh, player controls Austria-Hungary, although each state has their own administrative record sheet and victory point calculations, which are totaled at the end. Germany may give funds to Austria-Hungary, but not vice versa. The two states begin with a defensive alliance. Austrian units may not use any merchant vessels for transport. So the, uh, the next step is the uh, end-of-turn victory point uh, record calculation, which you can see uh, here at the bottom. And so the treasury balance at the end of the turn uh, is done during the, the victory point rec recording phase. And you divide it by the state divisor, which you can see here on the left of the, uh, of the slide, which is at 10 for Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain's got an established uh, colony. It's quite wealthy, and so the divisor is quite high. So the English have to work very hard uh, in order to win this game. So in section uh, six, the final victory point record, uh, you can take the total across um, line 26 here, and you, you total it here. So at the end of the game, uh, there are a couple of victory point sources. Uh, whichever country established an east-west or north-south path across Africa receives a victory point bonus. Uh, you can uh, see historically the confrontation between the English and the French in Sudan in 1898 at Fashoda, in which the England stood down the French, and they were able to establish uh, a complete red path from um, Egypt to South Africa, uh, or rather, they got close to it. Um, uh, it was only really facilitated by the, de by the defeat of Germany and the occupation of uh, Tanganyika. The Americans have a policy of uh, open access to China, uh, and so opposed the exclusive accesses that the uh, European soldiers had out. Um, and, of course, there's a sort of scramble for uh, Africa, which was a, a major feature of um, uh, this period from 1880 to the outbreak of the uh, First World War. And it was largely driven by the European discovery of quinine and other methods to resist malaria uh, that had made earlier expeditions um, uh, so treacherous 
So here you can see the 1882 Anglo-Egyptian War in which the uh, English uh, invaded Egypt to, uh, to solidify their control of the communications routes to uh, India. Here's the, uh, the revolt in Madis Sudan against the British Army. Here's a Chinese Gordon, also known as Gordon of Khartoum, uh, before he's killed by the Mahdi in Khartoum, which then led to, subsequently to a, a, a relief expedition. The, this is the application of the machine gun against the uh, Mahdists, uh, in which uh, the British were able to impose their control over Sudan. Here's the Battle of Tel El Kabir. Uh, here is uh, Omdurman, uh, the first battle. I believe Winston Churchill was somewhere in this battle. Uh, here you can see Omdurman again. Here's the Mullah of Somalia, resisting the British. Uh, there's the Boer War at the end of the 19th century. This is a uh, statue in downtown Montreal showing Canada's contribution to the fight against uh, the Boers. Here's the French Dahomey War of 1892-94. Uh, here you can see the Ethiopians defeating the Italians at the Battle of Adoa uh, at the end of the 19th century. Yeah, you can see uh, the Emperor of Ethiopia uh, involved in the attack. Uh, here's uh, Theodore Roosevelt's uh, charge. Uh, during uh, the uh, Spanish-American War, which the Americans uh, essentially took over uh, Cuba and other Spanish possessions in uh, Central America, the Caribbean, and Asia. Uh, here you can see another component of that attack. There's Theodore Roosevelt on his horse. So, um, the setup for the game um, is as is depicted here. Uh, you have initial forces deployed, some in home countries, others on the map. You've got various um, possession markers and control markers that are uh, deployed on the map. Here you can see uh, Africa and Asia and South Asia and the uh, North African coast. You can see the merchant vessels deployed as well. Uh, here you can see the deployments in Asia. Uh, the British are in, in Hong Kong. Uh, the Japanese have not asserted themselves outside of their own territory except for their uh, merchant vessels. This is really the beginning of Japanese uh, uh, colonial efforts. Uh, here you can see um, the Western Hemisphere in contrast to East Asia. You can see Hawaii is, at this point, not possessed by uh, anybody. Uh, here you can see uh, East Asia's uh, deployment um, more closely. So, let us uh, uh, go through a, uh, a couple of sample uh, phases of, of this game so we can see how it looks. Uh, so, uh, here we have the scramble for Africa, a German, British, Italian, and French uh, seizure of protectorates and establishment influences and interests. You can see the question marks, which indicate unestablished uh, attempts uh, at control. You notice that uh, Italy went for Egypt, which you can see in the, in the top right corner. None of the states are competing, uh, so as to cause a causus belli, but they could have. Uh, a tip here is when purchasing military units... Uh, by small denominations, uh, because if you suffer losses in combat, you cannot break down units into lower denominations, and so you'll be unnecessary, unnecessarily losing additional strength points. Uh, here you can see the uh, scramble for Asia. Uh, Japan has, is seizing Korea and Taiwan. Uh, Russia should have placed an influence marker in Korea or competed against Japan in Korea. Uh, here's another tip. Expand early with control markers, such as protectorates and possessions, since these cannot later be overthrown unless the possessor is overthrown in a random unrest event, and then loses the colonial combat, or you have a causes belly against that state and you can you use the war as an excuse to invade and seize the territory. Uh, there's a scramble for uh, other areas, such as the, uh, the uh, putting uh, interest markers in South America, uh, which is a very lucrative area. Uh, merchant fleets should get access or should be placed in, in a way that they give access to the southern Atlantic. Uh, here you can see the uh, U.S. seizure of Hawaii by an attempted placement of a protectorate. So on game turn one, uh, 1880, uh, you have the administrative phase. Uh, here you, you get the maximum payout from the colonial office, uh, which is typical for most uh, of the players, uh, that have states that do not have an established control marker, which is either a protectorate or a possession um, on the map. So the U.S. and U.K. and France must roll for points, even on the first turn, because they all have possessions already in play. So the tip here is to deploy every single interest marker you can, as they're completely free of maintenance costs. 
So um, uh, colonial combat is is resolved, uh, all successfully, all successful for the invading colonial powers, and protectorates are established um, uh, here in Africa. Typically, as a sort of a rule of thumb, you typically you're seeking three to one odds. Uh, colonial armies are not expensive, and defeat is rare when the attack odds are three to one. In other words, an only a one in six likelihood of defeat. So states should not fear risking expansion. Uh, some areas have zero defense strength, so they should be seized early in the game. Circle values are additional protectorate numbers uh, and their their total values. Okay, here you can see uh, the same uh, scramble in Asia. So, uh, if we look at the uh, administrative section, section 5, the uh, victory point uh, record... Uh, most states spent money on colonies and did not immediately buy victory points. And this is a sound strategy of resource investment. You, you basically want to sp uh, spend money early on expanding and get uh, victory points later on. Um, so that was 1882. Now this is 1884, the subsequent uh, admin phase. Uh, you can mark the left margin with the marker symbols as I have here. A random event has required the Russians to spend their money on armies and navies. Uh, Belgium uh, uses the Italian colonial office table for their points. So this is the uh, movement phase for 1884. Treasuries are adjusted for purchase of markers and military units. I will require that all treasuries be kept up to date on the blackboard in the class. I also require that each country keep a list of all of their interests, influences, protectorates, possessions, states, and dominions for easy inspection by other players for auditing purposes, you know, in order to keep us all honest. Uh, when calculating your admin sheet treasury, you must have it approved by at least one other state's player as a form of a quick certified audit. So here in uh, 1884, uh, South, South America has many interest markers. Again, the tip is, place interest markers in areas where you want to establish a sphere of influence, since if another state tries to establish a control marker that cancels your influence marker, you get a casus belli and have an option to go to war. With an interest marker, you do not have that war option. So here in 1884, uh, the Americans spent uh, $30 uh, dollars, uh, and built the Nicaraguan Canal, and they get 15 victory points. All right, here in the, uh, in the scramble for Africa, there's an attempt to create possessions and a deeper geographic uh, penetration. Uh, and here, uh, well, here you can see the uh, unrest um, uh, emerged uh, here in um, uh, the Italian possession of, um, of in Africa. Um, note that Italians did not have to be in Egypt. They could have come from Italy by boat, by their merchant fleet, uh, to deal with the unrest. It would have been cheaper that way. So uh, here you have the 1884 scramble for Asia. Many Japanese, English, and French interests and influences are established in China and control markers in China's tributary areas, which drives up China's, re China's resentment index. So uh, here you've got the uh, 1884 uh, colonial combat and marker adjustment, adjustment phase. Uh, you've got the creation of possessions, which result in the removal of all other interest markers, creating exclusive economic areas in Africa. Uh, in the colonial combat and marker um, adjustment phase, you have the creation of possessions, which result in the removal of all other interest markers. Uh, you have the uh, creation of exclusive economic areas in Asia. Now, there's another tip. Note that the military units deployed outside of your own country cannot be repatriated until the next turn's movement phase. And it is during the admin phase of the next turn that these military units will be paid for. So you're not going to escape uh, paying for units that you send outside of your territory. So, um, uh, developments in Asia drive the Chinese resentment index to 54, meaning that if uh, you roll 3d6 and the total of those values is uh, equal to, uh, 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 less than or equal to 5, um, which is uh, the tens value of 54, then China would, would attack the invading uh, colonial powers. So in uh, Section 5, uh, 1884, uh, victory point records, uh, many states use their treasuries to buy victory points, uh, which are added to the victory points purchased on the previous turn. Uh, tip, it is important to save most of your treasury to buy victory points uh, at the end of each turn, all right? But certainly not in the first couple of turns, but, but soon this is how you're going to make the points necessary to win. 
So turn three, 1888, uh, here you've got much larger treasuries uh, due to colonial income. Both Italy and Japan have their colonial offices uh, uh, incomes doubled, but they must spend at least $30 uh, dollars on military units. Here's a tip. Troops deployed outside of your home areas cost money, and since they can intervene instantly against a colonial uprising and can in war eventually travel across the map to the battle area, the maximum number of troops should be deployed in the home country. However, states may want to have some visibility of the military for deterrence purposes. Now, random events uh, have created unrest in Anatolia. Russia purchases a large army of 94 strength points and intervenes. Because England, France, Italy, and Germany have influence markers in Anatolia, and the Russians are seeking to establish a possession, this gives these offended states a casus belly. Also, they have an excuse to block Russian expansion. If four of these states go to war, then the general war breaks out and the game ends. The first state to declare war against Russia, and the fourth state that, that declared war, making the war a general war, would suffer a triple victory point penalty, which would cause them to lose a fairly badly. Therefore, the two largest states remain, and during the negotiation phase, the British and French depart. The Russians attack with 60 troops versus 20 Anatolians. The result is 2 on the 3 to 1 odds column. Uh, so for table 2, we're looking at uh, the weaker side has more than 5 strength points. And the result is green, which is indicated here by the, by the pencil. Uh, in the green, Anatolia is defeated, but the Russians lose half of the defeated side's strength. So half of 20 is 10, so Russia loses a 10 strength army unit. Russia establishes the possession and eliminates the influence markers, causing European unrest to rise. Since Russia has placed a control, a possession marker, in the Ottoman Empire, three five-strength Ottoman units automatically attack Russia. Italy and Germany decide to come to Turkey's aid. Now, there are 84 Russian strength points against 83 combined strength points of Ottomans, uh, Germans, and Italians. So Russia rolls an initiative value higher than the Ottoman and therefore goes first. Russia attacks with 84 troops against 83 troops, the combined forces of the Ottoman, the Germans, and the Italians. The result is a 3 on the 1 to 1 odds column. And here again, we're looking at table 2 because the weaker side has more than 5 strength points. Uh, the result is yellow, which is an exchange. So all of the Germans, Italians, and Turks are eliminated, and Russia must lose the same number of soldiers. So what's left? Well, Russia is left with a single unit, which is necessary to be there for the possession. But it wins, and it takes control of Anatolia. The European tension index rises to 56. So the victory point record, uh, Russia's won the war, but it spent so much on its armies it could not afford to buy victory points. So at the end of turn 3, 1888, Italy has 53 victory points, Germany and France each have 46, Belgium is 42, the US 41, Japan is 35, the UK has 31, and Russia is only 4. So there are some uh, country-specific rules that the players should refer to uh, in the rules. Uh, Great Britain needs to know needs to be familiar with the Indian Garrison Rules, the Suez Canal Rules, the Dominion Rules, and the Chinese Resentment Table. Uh, Germany needs to know the Austria-Hungary Alliance Rules and the Balkan Wars Rules. Russia needs to know the Garrison Rules, the Chinese Resentment Rules, the Balkan Wars, and rules about the Ottoman Empire. The Japanese should focus on Chinese Resentment. U.S. needs to know the Monroe Doctrine, rules, Panama Canal, and the Spanish-American War rules. Italy needs to know the rules about the Ottoman Empire and the Suez Canal, and France needs to know the Suez Canal rules and Chinese resentment. So this concludes uh, the rules for Pax Britannica.